Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to this breakout session today. I'm going to go ahead and get started because we've got four speakers and um, I'm sure they're going to want to talk to you for more than 20 minutes apiece, but we'll try and keep it on schedule here. Um, my name is Scott Henderson, a research scientist at the University of Washington eScience Institute. And I'm really excited about this session and the people who are going to be speaking today. It's a group of accomplished graduate students and research scientists and also data engineers. So I figured we'd get some perspective on um, end uses of uh, data sets that are being stored on the cloud. So if you're in the previous session, which was great, we heard a lot about um, pipelines, processing pipelines, getting data um, from satellites finalized and available to scientists. And this section, this session is going to be more focused on use cases um, from that point forward. So to start off, um, Amy Barchowskis is going to be um, presenting her work at Development Seed. Um, I'll let her introduce the topic in detail, but she's going to be discussing the multi-mission algorithm and analysis platform. So we'll start with Amy and um, the presentations are going to be about 18 minutes so that we'll have some questions for each person afterwards. And at the end, if we have time, uh, we should have a bit of time for more general questions. Hello. Um... Yeah, so my name is uh, Amy. I'm going to be talking about the project that I work on, the Multi-Mission Algorithm Analysis Platform, or the MAP, uh, which is a cloud-based open science platform for biomass estimation. Uh, so this is sort of taking what was discussed during the previous session and bringing it to uh, application. So we're building an open sci science platform specifically for biomass estimation, and we'll be talking more about how we're doing that. Um, but the bio, uh, but the map is not just me. Um, so I'm a data engineer at Development Seed, but the map is actually a cl uh, collaboration between the ESA and NASA space agencies, and a lot of other um, really, you know, smart, productive people have been working on this. So I want to make sure to give, um, you know, to talk about them. A lot of some of them are actually in the room. We have Chris Linus, Namrata, Sujin. Um, so a lot of, uh, you know really hard work has gone into this project from people at JPL, as well as the impact group, which is um, out of Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, and some people at HQ as well. And that's within NASA. Um, so the MAP is a science-focused cloud-based virtual environment to discover, process, analyze, and share ESA, NASA field, airborne, and satellite data. And um, if you were at my presentation yesterday, you'll know how much I like this video that sort of gives you a cute little, um, you know, CGI animation of how the JEDI uh, LIDAR instrument works. So this is helpful, especially for us, um, you know, non-scientists to sort of understand how these satellites work. So this is showing how the JEDI, uh, the JEDI satellite is going to be beaming these lasers down to the forest floor. And as those lasers are beaming down, they're receiving signal from this forest floor at different um, time, you know, time delays. And those time delays that the, the signal is responding with is enabling us to create these 3D render, these 3D maps of um, biomass and, and canopy height of the forest. And those are called these um, uh, LIDAR waveforms. So the MAP is a new paradigm for delivering open science, and it's a new paradigm because it's uh, a partnership between NASA and ESA, where both, where both agencies are providing mm -hmm. um, technical and scientific expertise along with critical data sets. So why is open science um, important? I'm sure a lot of you guys agree that open science is important. Um, one of the reasons why it's important is because you guys might have um, heard of the file drawer problem or publication bias. So this is basically the idea that um, uh, a, a scientific result is m perhaps more likely to be published if it's, you know, surprising and surprising might not necessarily be a good thing, right? So if um, a test is run 100 times and you, um, you uh, fail to reject the null hypothesis 99 times, but like the last time you um, can't reject or, yeah, if you fail to reject, you, you do reject the null hypothesis, um, 
then in that, that one case, that might be the surprising result that ends up getting published. Um, so one of the really cool things about an open science platform is that it supports reproducible science, right? By sort of uh, codifying these practices, putting all the data and the algorithms um, in, in one place together, we're able to basically support this idea of reproducible science and make the you know, hope that the file drawer problem and publication bias um, gets reduced. So what is the map? As I mentioned, it's a science-focused virtual environment dedicated to the unique needs for sharing and processing data from relevant field, airborne, and satellite measurements related to both ESA and NASA missions. It reduces a, um, a need expressed by the science community to more easily share and process data collected by NASA and ESA activities. So project objectives and key features. Um, so we want to provide a version controlled science algorithm development environment that supports tools, co-located data and processing services. Uh, we also, um, you know, a, a new sort of thing that's coming out of the map is to in, address the intellectual property and sharing issues related to collaborative, collaborative algorithm development and sharing of data algorithms. Um, and we also are identifying best practices for interagency collaboration and developing a better understanding of each other's programmatic processes, objectives, and about abilities. And that's between ESA and NASA groups. So to provi provide a little bit of context about this project, um, I wanted to provide a timeline. Um, so MAP isn't a done thing. It's something that's being actively developed. Um, right now we're in pilot development you can see, um, yeah, so you can see that red line there is representing where we are right now. You can see we're very close to the tip of the pi pilot development, um, which might explain why I look more tired, tired than usual. Um, but yeah, so, so we're near the end of pilot development. We're gonna be in pilot ops soon, which basically mean, means we're gonna have a, a user work, working group that is testing out the map pilot platform and giving us very useful feedback that we're going to be um, you know, incorporating into the full map feature development. And that's gonna be happening in 2020, 2020 and 2021. So why do we need the map? Um, so we want to store and collocate data volumes. Uh, we want to provide access to compute resources for global and temporal scale analysis. Um, and we also want to address the scientific community, um, their needs to have improved data and algorithm sharing and collaboration across users and organizations. So this is a nice little Venn diagram describing how this works. So we have ESA and NASA are both developing their own computing platforms. ESA and NASA are both providing data. Um, however, the, the MAP platform itself is you know, providing joint access to data and algorithms. So, um, you know, for the purposes of this particular uh, uh, session, how is MAP achieving scalable data proximate cloud computing for biomass estimation? Uh, so this is um, the architecture diagram for the MAP. Um, it's been used many, many times. Um, so it, it's been around for about a year and a half. It might be slightly, you know, could have some slight adjustments, but it's mostly still accurate. So we have these, um, these, these three types, the three types of users that I'm gonna point out are these algorithm developers um, on the left using the algorithm development environment, which accesses the um, al uh, map algorithm store. And then we have the data explorers and the data analysts on the right. So those, those data explorers are the ones that are gonna be going into sort of the visual interfaces and searching, searching the data and visualizing the data um, they might also be those users that are more, more typical clients of, if you guys have been conversation, in conversations about analytics ready data sets, so they might be looking more for those analytics ready data sets, whereas the algorithm developers are the users that are looking more at the, um, you know, earlier types of products um, to develop their algorithms upon and, and develop those higher level products. Uh, so elements of the map. Um, so this is, um, you know, this is sort of our, our glossary of acronyms for the map. I'm not going to walk through all of them at this moment, um, but just to give you sort of a high level overview of all the services that um, were in the previous slide. This is most of them. The first one I'm going to talk about is the map catalog and data store. So the key innovations with our implementation of a map catalog and data store is um, you know, one thing I think that is really cool about the map is we are really basically um, some of the a first major client of this sort of ESDIS um, 
he has this philosophy of open source software. So we have our own deployments of as this open source software projects uh, cumulus uh, for cl collection and granular metadata, the common metadata repository, a metadata management tool, as well as search, our uh, Earth Data Search client. And so we're running our own versions of those and, and uh, basically using Cumulus um, and publishing these data sets, we've ingested and cataloged uh, approximately 12 terabytes of data, including airborne and field LIDAR data for validation. And we're developing tools to accept metadata from user-generated data um, and developing extensions to the CMR specifications for user-generated data. Um, and we've also developed extensions to integrate Earth Data Search Client with JupyterLab to let users seamlessly use uh, search results within their algorithm. So I want to demonstrate what this looks like. So basically, um, this is Eclipse J, which is our algorithm development environment. Um, so we, uh, so part of the MAP um, project has been to basically embed Earth Data Search Client within Eclipse J. So this user has basically gone and created a search in the Earth Data Search client, and then is able to basically go in directly into a Jupyter notebook and uh, paste the search result, paste the search results in a, a Jupyter notebook. So for visualization, um, we have uh, so key innovations for visualization. We're utilizing a serverless architecture to provide dynamic fast browse capabilities. So this is with um, cloud optimized geotiffs. We've integrated the common mapping client as a Jupyter Lab extension for visualization and extension. And we're also using the OGC WMTS standard for interoperability. And um, the, so this, these little icons on the bottom basically represent at a very high level how this is working. We have the cloud optimized geotiffs, which are sitting behind the OGC WMTS standard. Um, and then the common mapping client is the common mapping client is a is a user interface into basically is able to um, read in you know a WMTS capabilities document and represent the layers that are in that WMTS capabilities document. And um, this is let's see. So this is a screenshot of what that looks like within our Jupyter Lab environment. So um, you know some folks at JPL have, have developed this IP uh, sorry Pi CMC. PyCMC library, um, which enables us to basically embed the common mapping client as um, an interface within a JupyterLab notebook. So when you call PyCMC mapCMC, um, it basically is able to load in a get capabilities XML document, which um, represents the layers and then automatically represents those as layers within this user interface. Um, okay, so algorithm development environment, which I've already sort of uh, previewed in previous slides. So that's what we have for our shared workspaces. So this is being done with um, uh, a piece of software called Eclipse Che and also um, Jupyter Labs. So here we're using Eclipse Che as an integrated development environment built on Docker and Kubernetes. This is providing an online uh, coding environment um, where users can reuse and create stacks of operating systems and software. This is very similar to basically like a Docker image. Um, and we've, uh, and again, we, there's a map specific Jupyter Lab stack, which includes a number of useful extensions, including a native widget for the map, common mapping client. Um, and here again is a little uh, video of how this works. So. This is um, basically a user going in and creating a new workspace. And here I'm selecting the JupyterLab IDE, which is the one that's created for the map, which comes with a bunch of map extensions. And as um, that loads in, I'll also mention that um, basically you can share workspaces across users, right? So actually the workspace that I'm loading in this particular video is um, was originally created by my colleague, George Chang. So he created that workspace and shared it with me, um, yeah. Okay, so data processing service, um, AKA scalable data proximate compute. So if you were in the previous session, um, you might've already learned that we're using, uh, you might've already heard of HiSDS, which is um, JPL's uh, hybrid science data system. So we've made this available as a self-service data processing system based on the workspace and code paradigm of an algorithm development environment. We've um, added API extensions to make HiSDS compliant with the OGC web processing service standard. 
um, and provided direct integration with JupyterLab and can be invoked um, via GUI or JupyterLab commands. So this is a screenshot of basically the sort of um, summary of the OGC WPS endpoints for, um, for our map API. So you can see there's a get capabilities, execute, get status, and describe process endpoints available. And then this is a video basically showing um, a user who's going to kick off a new job. So they're, they've first gone and listed all of the algorithms that are available within the existing map platform. Then they've gone and selected, um, they've selected a specific algorithm that they're interested in running. They get back all of the um, input parameters for that algorithm. Now that they know what the input parameters are, they're gonna go and actually submit a request to run that algorithm. So they've um, named the algorithm. Now they're going to input some parameters that are required. They're gonna click OK. They're gonna get back a job ID. Uh, once they have that job ID, they're able to use that job ID to actually get, um, get the current status of the job. So here that says job started. Okay, so then we have the map algorithm store, store or the way to create and share algorithms. So we've integrated um, GitLab with HighSDS API to register jobs, added to the map API the algorithm endpoint to register algorithms in GitLab, and map API is direct integration with JupyterLab and can be invoked by GUI or JupyterLab commands. So this is another little video um, to build on the last one. Basically, this is a, um, so if you can't see the name of this notebook is called demo search. So this user is basically going to create an algorithm, which is going to show um, another user how to create a search within uh, JupyterLab. So this person has some code that's basically going to do a search of the metadata in the common metadata repository. And they're going to basically um, try and create a new algorithm to demonstrate that search capability. They just got an error that basically one of the files they wanted to commit to this, this algorithm was not committed to Git. So they're going to go ahead and commit that, commit that file. So this is a demonstrating the, the GitHub integration within the Eclipse Che interface. Um, so they're going to make a commit message. After they make that commit message, they're going to basically um, try and register the algorithm again and, um, and have a successful re successfully registered algorithm message. Um, and finally, all of these things that I've mentioned are wrapped in the Math API. So that's a common set of web services between NASA and ESA platforms that it adheres to open standards, those OGC standards. and and NASA um, Unified Metadata Model standards that um, we've been talking about. This map API is integrated with the underlying um, infrastructure services that we've talked about. So map CMR, dynamic tiling API, and high SDS. Um, and this map API is also complemented by a map Py, um, Python library wrapper to invo invoke these map API endpoints. And this is basically the the Swagger docs um, for, you know, just to demonstrate the, the Swagger docs for this particular API endpoint um, are available as well. So what we're working on. So um, some exciting things that we're working on um, as we move forward with the MAP project, uh, improved management of data prov provenance via algorithm metadata models. Um, so this is something that NASA is working on is an algorithm metadata model and supporting algorithm publication tool to codify the process of developing algorithm theoretical basis documents or ATBDs. Um, we're also in you know, talks, conversations, lots of deep, deep thought conversations about AODS, analytics optimized data stores. Um, and so some of the things that we're exploring there in terms of tooling, of course, there's a lot of sort of philosophical questions about AODS and ARD and stuff like that as well. But um, in terms of tooling, we're talking about ZAR, Parquet, um, COGS, and services for fast, fast subsetting and analytics, such as Athena, SDAP, Pangeo, and Dask. Um, we're also, uh, oh, we're so, so we're also working on the idea of user added data, right? So imagine you're a user of the map, you're creating a really great biomass estimation product, and you want to contribute that back, contribute that new data product back to the map platform. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot around that, um, which is actually tied to the conversation of algorithm metadata models, right? Because you want to be able to basically embed the algorithm that you use to create a new product in the metadata for your new product 
Um, so that's that's something that we're working on. Opportunities presented by the map. So um, learning how to build interoperable first. So one of the one of the interesting things about this project has been always to make sure we're thinking about an implementation that works for both NASA and ESA data. Uh, we also are con uh, thinking about how we can contribute to open standards. So we want to contribute back what we have learned about using CMR, CMR's unified metadata model and OGC standards to make them more extensible. Um, and then we also, uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting about analytics optimized data stores, so we're providing services which basically are, you know, our ideal is to provide these services which provide di direct access to the data through things like Athena um, or, um, you know, another database service. Uh, so these AODS still require people to figure out how to actually query them, right? Like how to find those endpoints that are queryable. Um, so this is this is an opportunity and it's a challenge because um, there's no current convention to do this, right? There's no CMR metadata model for um, how to query a service at the moment. So we're we're that's something that we're thinking about. Um, yeah. So if we move to AODS, this has implications for collection and granular metadata. Many search tools, analysis libraries, and OGC standards um, still all understood un assume an underlying file store. So thanks. And questions? I will take questions. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dave Neufeld, um, NOAA series. Just question about um, you mentioned twelve terabytes, I think, of data so far, um, which for LIDAR-based remote sensing systems strikes me as a little bit low, um, potentially. And so I was curious, you know, what, what sort of expected growth um, and, and what the, maybe what is being stored um, yeah, so in the cloud and, and then long-term, maybe costs, costs associated with it. So I guess, yeah, it's just kind of two parts. So first we are in sort of like this pilot development stage. So we've sort of prioritized certain lists of data sets and certain, not all of them are, are LIDAR and, and certainly not satellite based LIDAR, right? We haven't started ingesting the JEDI, the JEDI data at all. Um, so there's certainly much more data to come. Um, this is just the, the initial set of data that we've collected so far. So that's, that's some airborne field LIDAR and then data from existing satellite missions that is not LIDAR at all. It's like UAV, like SAR data, um, even like uh, Landsat, data, Landsat service reflectance, a lot of ancillary data sets. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question if anyone would like. If not, I do have one question. Um, thanks, it was really impressive stuff you guys are doing. I'm wondering, it seems like especially with integration with these tools like we heard about with HiSDS, there's the potential to rack up huge costs. And so I'm wondering how um, kind of like user limits are specified within the system for people who have access to it. Yeah, that's a really good question because it's something that we are still asking ourselves. So for pilot, it's not really too much of an issue because we're going to have a small working group and we don't really have to worry too much about like scaling out a huge amount. Um, but it's something that for full, basically we want, you know, a way for basically to allot a certain amount of, you know, resources maybe to like a certain user, but we actually don't unfortunately have an answer for that, right? And I know it's something that's probably of interest to like Pangeo type deployment as well, right? Because you want to provide... Um, you want to provide people access to, you know, data proximate compute without like blowing your budget. Um, so yeah, it's something I think everybody's trying to figure out. Great. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. So um, our next speaker is Aji John. Aji is a graduate student at the University of Washington in the Department of Biology. He's doing um, really interesting work integrating satellite remote sensing with sensor networks um, in Mount Rainier National Park. So he's going to tell us about some of that work today. Hi. Um, thanks, Scott. So. Uh, I'm Ajay, and again, uh, I'm uh, second year, uh, going to be third year now. 
a biology student, a grad student, and um, sorry, how did it go out? So uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk about a part of my uh, work which I'm doing at Mount Rainier, which is not sensor related. Uh, but it's to validate our, the, the data which the sensors collect. So I'm interested in, in climate right above the ground and how it uh, plays a role in the seedlings, in the under forest canopies at Mount Rainier and how the climate right above the ground relates to the, the phenology of the wildflowers, which is different development stages. So uh, there are a few collaborators in this work uh, because when we stepped into analyzing satellite imagery, it was a very confusing field. So a lot of these things you would see is somewhat basic, you, you know, but we thought we'll start at a very basic level. So uh, just to give you a brief outline, I'm just going to do uh, a rundown of, you know, what do I, what, the, what do we mean by scientific workflows? Uh, which are similar to pipelines in uh, in genomics, and uh, um, in the if you look at the in in the genomic space, they call workflow pipelines. So and how the serverless paradigm we have talked we have seen in the previous talks about um, serverless architecture, you know lambdas and uh, cloud functions so and so. And how, what kind of phenology workflows, um, which we we worked with, um, and uh, we'll introduce a product which we've been trying to develop at the same time, to to exploit sort of the the explosion of the cloud aspect or the cloud serverless aspect, and how you would typically run a workflow with Sweep. Um, that's a, you can think of it as a platform which we have developed, which still is a very early stages. So would really appreciate feedback. Um, although you know, I, I have kept the presentation at a very high level. So if interested, please uh, see me after this. So um, so so typically, if you think about the um, how the workflows have evolved, is that you can think of a workflow as a sequence of tasks, which you know, which um, which which does a piece of work. Um, true. So for 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 me, let's say the piece of work or the question which I would wanted to see is that what's the probability of flowering at a particular meadow at at Mount Rainier, let's say at a, in a at in in subalpine sites. So you know, typically I would have to go get the data, have to do some sort of um, data wrangling stuff. I have to search. I have to get some corresponding TIFF files, matching those, and then I have to um, do some calculations, um, NDVI most commonly be used, and then, and how I would use that to uh, then run an algorithm of my choice, let's say, which is just to say detect phenology, yes or no, binary response uh, at a particular site. So, you know, in the, in the traditional sense, you would have an on-site one server where you would put all these tasks together, you will chain it with some programming language and you'll run it. Um, or you could go to the cloud, you, you rent some servers and you run it in a virtualized way. Um, or you would run as a service where, you know, it would be like a combination of services. Let's say uh, if you look at Amazon stack, you might use, uh, let's say their DB as a service or their container as a service, you will just combine all, all of them into to, to, to do your work. And then truly as a function as service, I think we, we heard one in the previous session where you could have a trigger-based kind of workflow where some serverless function is invoked, or you could have a, 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 a proper workflow defined on top of it. Or you could have container as a service where you have, we have heard about the Docker instances, you know, you could spawn through um, like a bunch of, uh, you can orchestrate a bunch of tasks which essentially are hardwired to or wired to, to Docker instances. Now, all of these are great. I mean, uh, I have listed a few, uh, which I think most of you would be aware, but just to, so Docker is, is, is very prominent in the, in the, in the, in the cloud space. 
Um, we have workflow products. I have mixed both of them, you know, some which is open source, some which not. We have heard about Dask. Uh, they're all great tools. They're all rather computationally. They, they, they give you a lot of leeway. They give you a lot of freedom in how you do it. But they, they, they're, I mean, to us, it seemed like a one-off solutions and there was no heavy reusability. So if I had to develop a, a stack which runs on Docker, it was very hard to replicate that with kind of a low cost option or to first of all understand it was quite difficult. Um, and it's a very steep learning curve and obviously the cost is something we have to be mindful of. Now, now essentially, you know, what we wanted at the end was that some, a workflow which can be reproducible. And then it's again, the cost is something uh, which we, which can be expensive or not with something with the budget you have, but generally for a graduate student, you don't have much, much room there. Um, but, and easy to learn, easy to grasp and easy to integrate. Um, so, and, and, and within serverless framework, it has been a great kind of um, sort of interest, sort of introduction is that it had, it, it has opened up basically the, the, um, sort of chopping off of the workforce into something very minute, like minuscule tasks, which can run from like nanoseconds to, to sorry, milliseconds, let's say, to, to like, uh, like around five minutes. Now I had put in both a function and a container. And I, the reason I put container as a service is that, you know, for computationally heavy tasks, you could still explore the options of a function as a service, which is Lambda or Cloud Functions or Azure Functions, but you could also have your same task can be swapped out to a container as a service, where you could go to Google or Amazon and run your same task as a, as, as a container task. Now, this is great because you don't have to worry about the rather doing the provisioning of your like the, rather, the, rather the computational rather backbone. You don't have to understand ramp up of scaling. Uh, you know, you don't have to worry about all of those things. So at the, the, the provider like Amazon would, would actually take care of it. Um, so again, it's you pay obviously for what you use. So essentially what we see is that the world where, where your workflow typically, you know, for me, it was the phenology workflow can be broken down into tasks, which is a mixture of Lambda task or a, like a serverless task or container task, which are rather, rather computationally heavy. And if we are able to successfully optimize our workflows, we can actually run more or less all of them as, as, as serverless um, rather functions. Now, and the beauty of it, if you're able to do that, and if you're able to do across cloud providers, that would be amazing too, because now you can become cloud agnostic. And so you don't have to have a vendor lock-in kind of issues. So, so, so that's where we see us, you know, which we see is a gap, which we, 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 we went to, we, we, we tackled and, and, and actually that's where we, we said, okay, how about we try to break this task into functions and then we needed a way to orchestrate the workflow, but they create the task with, with, with kind of different kind of backend, I mean, either a serverless function or a container. So, so that's where we went on to. And, and just to give you an appreciation of what a typical workflow would look like is, for example, here we said that, you know, it's a, so, so here I'm saying this is with the planet and planet is, uh, gives you three meter resolution data. So a, a sequence of tasks would be, you would start, you would search, you would come with your area of interest, which is, could be a GeoJSON or anything, and then you will something to inactivate, which is uh, you, would, you, would, you would provision the, um, you, you, you provision sort of, uh, not provision, I should say, you, you activate the resource on the planet side so, 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 that, so, so that it may becomes available to you to work with. And then you do a clip API again, where you take your area of interest from this large scene, and then that's the area which you are interested in. And then you run your in NDVI and then you do some sort of aggregation to say, say if I want a time series and if my search resulted for, you know, let's say 20 images across 20 days because uh, Planet is, uh, gives you almost, you know, like the multiple scenes uh, per week. Now, if the same image I would do with the Landsat, which would be, I have to use a different API. I would use to, I mean, we've been using 
um, the USGS Earth Explorer. Now, if you do that, the same thing is similar, but slight, not that same, but we had suffered in terms of how to use it, how to take the products, how to, how to parse it. So all these were like learning, rather learning for us, but in the essence, you could break down the whole workflow into these small steps, which for one day to one day would typically run within a minute. If, if you run this, all, all, all of this as functions on with Amazon. So something similar where here, the thing is that you have to reproject, you have to download, you have to do all those custom processing on top of the image which you got. And at the end, you will, you will still do some of the common steps. So here there's a great reusability which you can do. So if let's say NDVN aggregation is basically a, a function or a task, you can reuse it. Now, if I do with Sentinel, which is like a little, little bit of finer resolution, we could get a 10 meter resolution you would use a different API. So now if you think of that, it seems like we are approaching more to more cloud native kind of solutions where everything is on the cloud anyway. So all, all, all the things which you need is API. So the uh, so you to carry on all, the, rather carry forward all this data or store it becomes meaningless. So again, so these three workflows, which we, we explored, and again, these had various time, rather time to run. But, but in the end, in the sense, we saw a lot of reusability in these workflows. So, and then, so just to give an idea that where does the platform come in? There's a platform we needed that if you, sorry, sorry to flip back. So if you have a workflow like this, how would you run it, right? So, so we, we needed is something like a, a place where you could define a workflow definition. And there, I think we, we could bind to, I think from a previous uh, talk about SciFlow kind of approach, uh, here we he actually we went with something like a JSON kind of approach where we define a, a, a set of tasks and the CLI is can can actually deploy those functions deploy to the to to uh, to the sweep cloud which we call it where the whole uh, workflow is run which which calls the different functions um, across these providers. Currently we we have only provided the adapters to the Amazon. Um, and just to give you an idea, it's, it's pretty uh, small font here. So the user will typically use the client and then it will go to a cloud. So from cloud, the actual, you know, if you are working with Lambda, you have to produce some kind of a zip file, or if you're working with a, a con container image, you have to register your container image with, uh, with Amazon ECS. So here we can define the whole workflow as a JSON. It's just very intuitive. Um, and it has uh, all the standard features, like it has the map reduce, it, it, it does the internal representation as a DAG, and then it does the, 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 the management of the task, do all, all the rules processing on it. So, and at the end, it gives you the result back. Um, so this is one, one, rather one example where, where I'm showing is that how we, we've taken one of the Landsat workflows, and then I am just, is a very big, would be very much similar to like a, any other standard API call where you have um, you have some some authentication and then I would actually call this workflow. I am not showing you how the workflow was defined, but it just just think of it as all the JSONs had the function names in it, and then you had the the, the rules defined in it. Um, and we do most of the uh, rather workflow kind of tools like do, do doing the uh, the partitioning of input. Um, so if you had tasks which go from A to B, but the A is uh, giving out, let's say, their search, first search for a, a particular with the provider, it gave you five um, dates, second provider gave you 50. So you have to dynamically spawn those many number of tasks. So um, the platform takes care of it. Um, so this is, uh, th th this is an example where I'm just showing you sort of the set of tasks, how it's, how it's, dynamically um, scaling by spawning the, the number of tasks depending upon the predecessor output. So here the task two is basically the one which is a search and that search gives us basically three scenes. So there's a th you have to keep, you have to clone the task three, three times with three different inputs and then, and they, they, and, and they will go to, uh, you know, they will get spawned instantaneously. And with the, with the Lambda, you don't have to worry about, you know, how how rather how how it gets executed, and then they finish. They come to four, which is some sort of aggregation, and then you want to do the NDVI for all all five. I mean, it's all the three at the same time. They get finished, and six you do the aggregation. Um, 
I, I zipped through the presentation, so I thought I could give a lot more, more time for the questions. Uh, but we are very early in this stage, so um, we have done most of our work with only Amazon as a provider. So we explored uh, how we could um, deploy these tasks in a workflow, do the workflow management, uh, have the nodes be have the task be a function um, or uh, like a container rather containerized image of a of a task. We have a lot of stuff to do, but um, that's what PGs are for. Um, so we, we 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 have to do scheduling where we have the workflows which can be versioned, which can be run. So if you have a version for which you let's say high like a, like a lot big date range to small date range version controls. We don't have quite figured out how to store the outcomes of the functions. It's in case if you wanted the intermediary output or the whole output. Um, and quite frequently, uh, honestly, we have run into issues with these providers because of they have the limited, uh, because, with the, because they have the API limitations where um, you can't, you know, if you fire request frequently, you will get rather denial of service. That's by, by design. Um, so how to do like uh, exponential back off and those kind of things have to be done and how to intuitively define the, the designer and support for one other provider. So that's something that you want to do next. That's it. Questions? For a couple questions. Or maybe I missed this, but uh, are you planning to open source this? Is it already open yes, sourced? Yes, okay. at some point, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we have not quite figured out, um, rather, we have a couple of more milestones to achieve where it becomes fully functional. So, yes. Any other questions? It, so I may miss this, but is there any reason why you are not getting or using the data that's already made available uh, in the cloud providers? Uh, um, so, for example, Sentinel or Landsat. Oh uh, yes. So we did look into it. The thing with Sentinel was that it was requester pays. Yep. Um, and that was getting expensive. Okay. So you're pulling it into the. You're, you're taking it out of the region, basically. We are basically, and but you're not paying. Yeah. Yeah, but okay. but yeah, there is the but we wanted to provide that as well for Sentinel. There is a, like a mapping which you can do to the actual asset ID to the actual link on S3. Um, so that so yes, at some point we would like to give that. And the only reason we didn't explore that was because of the requester pays option limitation. Cool, thanks. But for the other providers like um, uh, for the for the Landsat, we we could do that. Uh, but right now we are just going with 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 Earth Explorer. What we could do is that we could modify the workflow to say just go to Earth Explorer to get sort of the metadata and then go to the actual URLs on the Amazon. So I have also one more question, maybe a follow up to this one. It, it seemed like in your workflow you're trying to bring in Sentinel to Landsat, which is the analysis analysis ready Landsat from USGS. Um, and planet. So presumably these are all in different regions currently or on different clouds or not on the cloud at all. They're all running simultaneously. So, and we are, are we getting the data from for the same dates from all of these three providers. And we're kind of shielding what happens in the back. Like a planet is with hosted on Google cloud and then um, rather Sentinel's data resides on Amazon. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, looks like we're right on time. So this is this is great. Next we have Julian Chastang from um, UCAR, Unidata. Julian's a software engineer, and he's going to be telling us today about efforts to provide a Jupyter Hub interface um, for different scientific applications. Uh, 
Hello, everybody, and welcome to this talk on deploying a Unidata Jupyter Hub on the NSF Jetstream Cloud, lessons learned and challenges going forward. So the outline of today's talk, I'm going to be talking about a bit of background and context about why we're doing what we're doing, deploying a GeoScience Jupyter Hub on the NSF Jetstream Cloud, and finally, some conclusions, lessons learned, challenges going forward. So we work on five-year proposals, 2019-2024 proposal is what we've just started, and science as a service is pro featured prominently in that proposal. And I'm just going to read to you from that proposal right now. The science as a service concept draws together Unidata's ongoing work to provide geoscience data and software for analysis and visualization with access to workflows designed to take advantage of cloud computing resources. So the key words there are science as a service and cloud computing. That's going to be the foundation upon everything that I'm going to talk about next. So we've been working on the NSF Jetstream Cloud for a number of years now. What is Jetstream? It's a national science and engineering cloud funded by the National Science Foundation for $11 million. There are two data centers, one at Indiana University, another one at the University of Texas TAC, the Texas Advanced Computing Center, and it is attached to fast Internet 2 capability, which is so important for the kind of work that we do transferring large data sets. It is a cloud based on OpenStack for the creation of VMs, routers, networks, subnets, et cetera. All that stuff has been virtualized. And Unidata has been operating on Jetstream for three years now through large research grants. Once you get through the granting process, Jetstream is free. So that's probably a huge advantage compared to the commercial cloud providers. Unidata's exploration of Jetstream thus far. So we start out by containerizing a number of our different technologies, the Threads data uh, server, the LDM peer-to-peer -peer data transfer software, Mekitis ADDE for satellite data, and Ramada, which is a geoscience content management system. We deployed these containers uh, on Jetstream to create a near complete Unidata data center. There's plenty of NSEP data, for example, at that threads URL right there. You can access that right now if you wish. But what about client-side offerings in the cloud? So the next obvious step is to do some data approximate analysis and visualization. And what tool is better suited for that than Jupyter? So what is a Jupyter notebook? I think we've all seen this, but it is a narrative first and foremost of explanatory and expository text followed by some software code and output, uh, predominantly probably in R, but the many, many languages are supported at this point. You can also embed equations with the help of math checks to produce uh, render LaTeX equations. And figures in multimedia are also allowed and enabled. The success of Jupyter Hub uh, in research and education is very apparent. Uh, here's a title from a Nature publication that came out last year about why Jupyter is the data scientist computational notebook of choice. Okay, and uh, Lorena Barber at George Washington University describes it as a killer app for teaching computing in science and engineering. So its success is clear, I think, to anyone who's attended this conference. Uh, Jupyter Lab is just a next generation UI, and that's equipped with a terminal for command line stuff. You can access your Git version control and Conda, et cetera, and you have a text editor in there as well, if you wish. The next logical evolution of all of this is the Jupyter Hub, which is the multi user Jupyter notebook server. Fernando Perez put it best in that it's just infeasible to support a large classroom of students install complex software on their on their laptops. So what is a Jupyter Hub? Uh, the Jupyter, the user will log into a Jupyter Hub server and then they will have their own space for their notebooks so that they can execute them and whatnot. It's really excellent for workshop and classroom settings. And then administrators, somebody like me, can do a lot to configure things ahead of time on behalf of the user and make things easier for the user so that they can get to their science as soon as possible instead of trying to install a TDF or something. But there's a problem. Uh, a single uh, Jupyter Hub server running on a single VM, even a large one, 
can only accommodate a small number of students, uh, 10 if even that. So the solution is the Zero to Jupiter Hub project, which aims to install Jupiter Hub across several orchestrated VMs to accommodate many more users with the aid of technologies like Kubernetes, Docker, virtual, machi virtual machines, et cetera. The bottom line is that Zero to Jupiter Hub allows for many more users on your data center. This is just a schematic of what I was just talking about. You have your cloud data center there on your right, and you have all your students there on the left, and there's all these worker nodes working for you being orchestrated with Kubernetes uh, going through the master node uh, to access their Jupyter notebooks, et cetera. The Zero to Jupyter Hub project was ported to Jetstream by that man on the left, Andrea Zonka, at the San Diego Supercomputing Center with the help of Jeremy Fisher uh, at Indiana University. Jeremy is at this conference, by the way. Uh, K8 stands for Kubernetes. Kubernetes, it's just an abbreviation. So you, we deploy uh, Kubernetes on Jetstream with the Cube Spray project. That's just the name of the project. Uh, and we use technologies like Terraform for the creation of VMs, routers, networks, subnets, et cetera, and Ansible to actually uh, create, and cluster, uh, create the Kubernetes cluster. <clears throat> I've added my own layer of scripting on top of that with a couple of scripts to aid in streamline and deployment since it's kind of an involved process. And you initially have to decide on the size and number of VMs with a configuration file called terraform.tf. And you can scale it manually thereafter, but there is no auto scaling in this kind of environment, not yet. Okay, so you customize these zero to Jupyter hubs with uh, YAML configuration files. Uh, you can have HTTPS with Let's Encrypt, or you can add your own custom certificates. You can have authentication with a GitHub or Globus OAuth, et cetera. I've used both. And you have a custom Unity Docker container with the Python Gallery, which is a bunch of Python and atmospheric and oceanic uh, sciences example notebooks, uh, the workshop, uh, which is uh, Pi AOS uh, training, and the online Python training, which tries to teach Python, but with a Pi AOS emphasis. The environment to run these uh, notebooks is already installed for you, so you just uh, log in and go, hopefully, and it's equipped with JupyterLab. There's persistent allocation for each user. Each user can get uh, 10 gigabytes of, of uh, disk space, and the disk space will remain for them indefinitely or until the whole thing blows up, which has been happening kind of a lot lately. <laughs> Okay, so we have a uh, Unidata Jupyter Hub at that uh, URL, uh, which is kind of not working right now. Uh, it's it's uh, using five medium one size VMs and uh, 30 CPUs of uh, 30 CPUs and 80 gigs of RAM. At one point, it actually had 60 users, though not concurrent. Uh, and there are some return customers uh, of that 60, but most of them were just like kind of trying it one time just to see what it was all about. In addition, we've supported uh, semester long classes at Notre Dame of Maryland University, though that did not use Kubernetes. Same at Southern Arkansas University. That was another semester long data science class. And we, over the summer, we've been supporting the uh, UCAR SOARS summer internship uh, program with this technology, which I would say, with some mixed results, I would say. So this is an example of something that you can uh, do with our Python gallery. This is a Miller composite notebook that would be meaningful to a meteorologist uh, doing some sort of analysis and it's pulling a, uh, data from a bunch of different uh, data sources to do this analysis that would be meaningful to a meteorologist. This is another example where it's pulling in data from disparate sources, satellite data, uh, and some GFS model data brought into one notebook for uh, a display there. Another example involving upper air skew T uh, data being displayed with the aid of the MedPy API developed at Unidata. 
Okay, so hopefully the interesting part of the talk. Uh, so there have been a number of problems uh, uh, getting this Jupyter Hub going. Uh, there is uh, finicky VMs during cluster creation. It often takes several times to get uh, these VMs um, even up and running in the way that you want. Uh, there are frequently timeout uh, errors at almost every level during deployment and running. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of complexity associated with uh, this software. The running software on the cloud has just introduced a whole new uh, order and magnitude layer of complexity uh, that's difficult to manage. So that, that there's a lot of complexity there. And when things go wrong, it's hard to get to the bottom of. Uh, there, I've been encountering Jupyter Hub spawn errors quite a bit lately. I've been trying to work with people uh, from on GitHub about that, uh, about those problems. There are a free, there are sometimes actually not that often, but occasional disk allocation errors when you're trying to attach that persistent storage to uh, the notebook environment that the people have logged into, the users have logged into. That, there have been network problems at TAC that have been. Um, stymieing us a little bit. And unfortunately, there's kind of a, a, a general lack of reliability throughout the entire tech stack. So this is borrowing from startup culture, where you have on the left there an initial period of elation, and then the novelty wears out. And then you enter this period of, of uh, the trough of sorrow. Uh, and and I, think, I think that I've reached the crash of ineptitude, actually, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and then, and then things kind of get better from uh, from there on out, and and so I, I expect things are, are going to get better here shortly. But uh, I, I, I've been kind of struggling lately. Uh, additional caveats for uh, all of this stuff. Um, well, yeah, what are you going to do with the the user's data over the long term? You have to consider that. Uh, you know, you got right now. I'm not making any guarantees, but it would be nice to have some. Uh, some better long-term storage there for the user's notebooks. Uh, this project is not Pangeo. I get this question asked all the time. Um, my goals are more are, are Unidata focused and more, more modest. So I would be very happy to deploy Pangeo on the Unidata Jetstream allocation if we can get Pangeo working on Jetstream. Uh, additional lessons learned, scriptify your deployments to make your life easier. Again, these setups are kind of complex and uh, involve many steps. I interview your users before you set up your cluster so that it can be accurately sized. I've made that mistake of um, setting up a cluster that was too small, and when the users started using it, it just kind of fell uh, flat on its face. Uh, and so just make sure that you understand what uh, your users are going to be doing on your cluster so that it can be accurately resourced. Uh, this tech stack is new and fragile. I think it's going to take some time before it, it, it gets uh, stable. Uh, I'm trying not to advertise uh, these resources too early. I want to scale gradually by introducing these technologies to incrementally wider audiences so that they can help me find problems and I can address those problems rather than a big splashy announcement that kind of uh, doesn't go anywhere. Uh, you need to be persistent. Uh, you need to be a persistent technologist really to overcome these uh, tech challenges. Uh, ask help for, for on GitHub issues. Also Gitter has been uh, a valuable resources, resource for me, that, that chat group online. And finally, this is just a, something that I've noticed over the last couple of decades is that science professionals often have a high threshold for problems as long as they can arrive at a desired scientific objective. So thankfully, I'm dealing with a patient audience that will kind of put up with these problems until uh, to get to some better outcome in the end. OK, uh, so some future plans. So I really want to get these technology problems under control. I don't, I don't want to build on a, on a Swiss cheese foundation. I want to experiment more with the Indiana U University Jetstream Data Center, which I think is going to be a little bit more stable for us. Uh, I want to uh, continue auto scaling or pursue auto scaling experiments with uh, Andrea Zonka uh, on the on OpenStack. Maybe try to get that working. Uh, address my, uh, GitHub issues, and then finally, when things stabilize, when we've attained that plateau stability, 
hopefully promote it to a wider audience. And I want to acknowledge a lot of people there. And I especially want to acknowledge those two individuals on the right that have been tremendously helpful over the last few years, Andrea and uh, Jeremy. And that is my talk. Everything that I talked about is available, uh, is described at that URL there. It's uh, well documented. And that's what I have. Thanks, Julie. Got time for a question or two before moving to the final speaker. Hi, um, I, we are uh, uh, Jupyter Hub instance as well, and I've noticed the same thing. Well, you're, you're fading in and out. I'm having uh, people on and then experiment and then go away. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas of what it would take uh, for people to really, you know, adopt Jupyter Lab as a day in, day out environment, uh, as opposed to just kind of like it's something to experiment with and go away. I think first and foremost, you have to give them something that works. <laughs> um, certainly, we, I've worked with early adopters who are willing to put up with problems, and I'm seeing that I'm seeing return customers. Uh, but I think that once things stabilize. And once it becomes the obviously easier solution where they don't have to muck with Conda to install whatever package, where they can just get to their science, their learning, their teaching immediately, and it's a stable environment that works, I think that it's just going to uh, grow exponentially and it's going to be uh, the solution in the long term. I'm confident that we're heading in the right path. It's just that it's going to take some time to get there. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thanks, Julian. Thank you. Our last uh, speaker for the session is Rich Signell. Rich is uh, a research oceanographer at uh, the US Geological Survey. He's going to be talking to us today about some of the work he's doing, some of his own research, and um, how he's utilizing the Pangeo project to accomplish his goals. If I can find my presentation. <laughs> Oops. All right, um, so I, I kind of totally changed this talk after uh, talking to some people earlier this week um, about, uh, and some of the people who are in uh, Scott's uh, hands-on Pangeo demonstration. I've been using Pangeo a lot, um, but a lot of people were asking me about Pangeo, and, and somebody said uh, to me, like, hey, I'm, I'm using X-Array on my laptop. Am I, am I using Pangeo? And I was like, well, yeah, kind of. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I decided to... Uh, give a talk uh, showing the different ways that actually the Pangeo uh, platform can be used. And uh, so it's called crunching model of data in the cloud, but um, I'm also going to show you some other ways and sort of try to talk about um, what you get on these different platforms. Okay. So um, I was also going to, I was thinking about calling it storm in the cloud, mostly because I kind of like this picture. Um, and, but actually this is, uh, I think the real uh, title is, should be the story of Dan. I'm the last talk of the day, right? So, <laughs> uh, Dan Nowaki uh, was in my group, um, postdoc. Uh, so I, I lead a little uh, modeling group at the USGS in Woods Hole. I should have introduced myself a little bit. Um, and Dan uh, is a happy guy. He's a modeler, um, and he's part of this. Uh, and in our group, we run the sediment transport modeling system, which actually has a fully coupled uh, wave, uh, wind and wave, water level. Uh, sorry, actually, atmosphere, ocean wave and sediment transport, okay? All of those models, all two-way coupled. It's actually the only uh, fully coupled modeling system of that type. And we use it for do all sorts of uh, sediment transport and coastal erosion studies. Anyway, we have like, this is developed by John Warner in our group. All of our group uses this. Dan uh, was using it as well. Uh, we have like 200 terabytes of NetCDF files. And that's why I became interested in Pangeo. Um, and, and so Dan, 
um, had a 700 uh, gigabyte, uh, yeah, 700 gigabyte data set that um, he had ran for a particular estuary. And, and Dan was having a good time in, in good old Woods Hole in December, but then he decided that, uh, actually it wasn't such a great old time, and um, he decided he wanted to move out to our sister office in Santa Cruz. So here he is a couple of weeks later in Santa Cruz, um, but he wanted to get at his data that he left on our server back in Woods Hole. So he, had his, he has his laptop and he has a, like a five uh, megabyte per second connection. What are, his, uh, what are his options? So, well, Dan can use Pangeo. So Pangeo, if you don't know, just a brief introduction, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a community platform big, for big data geoscience. It's a very welcoming community. It's really sort of curating this collection of tools uh, that, that lets you use the, any, pretty much anything in the Python ecosystem in kind of a scalable uh, way. And it kind of looks like, looks like this on the cloud. You have some distributed storage over on the, on the left-hand side, and uh, in the middle there is the uh, Python environment, which uses Dask to do scheduling and parallelization out, uh, that pull chunks from this distributed storage. X-Array provides a NetCDF data model, all of our outputs in NetCDF, and then Holoviz provides this interactive visualization in the browser, um, which I'm going to show you a little bit today, but a, a lot more tomorrow from um, Jim Bednar, who's going to be at the plenary. And I'm also going to show a little demo uh, tomorrow also from our Google uh, Summer of Code student. Anyway, this allows you to sit in, a, in, the, in the park with your, uh, with your Chromebook in your browser, in your, uh, your Wi-Fi hotspot on your phone, and crank away on tons of data. And so that actually should have been Dan. Ah, okay. And you interact through uh, Jupyter. Okay. So this is what it looks like on the cloud. And you pretty much, I think that's all we've heard about so far. Um, and on the cloud, uh, you know, the DAS cluster runs on Kubernetes. And so this is what it, this is the architecture for uh, when you're not on the cloud. Um, <laughs> I just subtracted the, uh, you know, cloud from the title there. But, and, and, and then, you know, in the DAS cluster, instead of running uh, on Kubernetes, it'll run on your HPC system. Or if you're on your laptop, it'll run on however many cores you have on your laptop. That's kind of cool. So, um, this is how you run Jupyter on a remote machine. I wanted to give you something you could actually use. And a lot of people are like, whoa, I didn't know you could do that. So it's, you know, you SSH in. Uh, if you can SSH to a machine, you can uh, basically run this little script, uh, you know, start Jupyter. You say Jupyter Notebook and a port, and, and, and then you print out a little helpful uh, statement, which, you, uh, which is your SSH command that you copy and paste on your local machine, and you're in. So now you're just using your notebook. Um, to interact with your remote machine. You don't need remote desktop or something, right? You're just using the regular old Jupyter interface. Um, and, so, and so these are Dan's options. He, can, he wants to calculate the mean salinity field from that 700 gigabyte data set. So he, can, he could download it to his laptop uh, if he had that much space and if he wanted to wait 16 hours, uh, or he could uh, log in remotely to the server where we our file server and um, and actually and access it there. Uh, sorry, sorry, I skipped a step. So he could also um, he could also connect and access the data through OpenDAP, right? And so that would look like the notebook for that would look like um, uh, would look like this. Okay. Um, so you know so you, so you start this local cluster. Okay. Um, and then, you, so you get four nodes. He's got four nodes on his laptop. Actually, this was me this morning in, in my hotel room, okay? So uh, I got four, four nodes, and um, I connect it up um, to the server and uh, open it up and uh, go along. Okay, make a plot. Yep, I got the data. Go ahead and calculate the mean. It took me 14 minutes. That's not too bad. <laughs> I mean, you know, take a shower, have a cup of coffee. That's not too bad. But um, there's a better way course. So, um, you know, he can log in remotely right to this, uh, right to this machine. And, um, and basically this, uh, you know, using that technique, technique I just uh, said, and, um, you know, it looks pretty much the same. He's got 16 cores now, and he can just point out a bunch of net CDF files and open them up with MF data set. He's got his, he's got his uh, little data set here and you know, scrolly, scrolly. And there's his plot, and he does the he calculates the mean 25 seconds. Dan's Dan's pretty happy. 
he's sweet. He's going to stop right there. Uh, but then his, uh, you know, his colleague uh, wants to do this, and um, well, we're not going to let the colleague log on <laughs> to our log on to our file server. So, um, well, if his colleague is at, at, in Woods Hole um, and is on the HPC system, then um, he has another option. So this is what it looks like if Dan actually has the data on our HPC in Woods Hole. Um, he can do the same stuff, except here's your, here's the difference. You say we we're on a Slurm system, and you can say from DAS job queue uh, import Slurm cluster and fire this thing up. You say you actually specify what you want here. You want one core and one process for a maximum of one hour, and we're going to use this interactive queue, and we're going to and then we're going to ask for 35 workers, and it just submits 35 jobs for one worker into your HPC system. And Dask is cool because uh, you know it can it can bring on workers and workers die. It doesn't care. It just keeps passing those tasks to the next available worker. So you might get five right away, and you get 15, and then you get 12. It doesn't matter. So and there's always processes sitting around on your HPC waiting for the big job to run, and like you know in 10, 20 minutes from now. And so you can always get some cores and do. And it's really kind of a crazy feeling doing interactive. Uh, processing of your data on your HPC system using your browser with this. <laughs> I mean, I've used HPC for a long time and I was like, whoa, this is so cool. Um, and so that's a great way to do it, except that, well, uh, that's great for, for Dan and the other people on the HPC system, but uh, not so great for the rest of the world. So what if Dan wants to share it with anybody? Then go to the cloud. So on the cloud, uh, same thing. Oh, wait, I forgot. Well, anyway, it's like same amount of time. <laughs> um, and so now we go to the cloud and we say, uh, I, want, I want 16 workers. Now I, the only thing different is we say cube cluster. So now we're going to do a Kubernetes cluster. And in this case, I did the same uh, kind of number of workers. I could have done 10 times more, of course, on the cloud. And I'm always going to get my workers on the cloud. Uh, I'm not going to have to wonder if, you know, kind of uh, the vagaries of the HPC system. And so in this, the only thing different here, too, is that um, if we open up those NetCDF files on the cloud, um, it, it, it actually uh, doesn't work so well. Actually, in, the, in this ori the original uh, uh, files for this, it takes um, it takes longer to open up the files um, than to uh, do the calculations. So uh, anyway, so we convert the data to ZAR, which we heard it talk about yesterday, uh, and which is a more cloud performant format. And in this case, boink, we get the the, the result in 35 seconds. Um, and I, how am I doing on time? Okay. Um, so I'm going to go back and show a quick uh, demo of something else. So anyway, so that's the that's the story of Dan. Um, you know, it, at every step, he's increasing the ability to have flexibility and share with more people. So you know, the cloud is the ultimate. But it's pretty cool to be able to do this stuff if you're not into the cloud yet, or somebody's not letting you. Or costs, you know, you're worried about the cost or something. You can do this stuff all with the same system. Uh, where, where you want. So um, we've been looking at the national water model output. Um, a lot of a lot of data there. That's a big push for the USGS and, and NOAA working together. Where can we do this work together? I think we should do it on the cloud, and I think we should do it in a scalable way. Um, and the uh, Amazon Open Data Program and the Sustainability Program are happy to help us with this. Um, and so here's a little demo. I hope I just uh, uploaded this to during. Uh, session here when I found out that this machine can't actually uh, run a live demo. And so, oh boy, yeah, you're not going to be able to see that too well. Hopefully it will get better resolution. Maybe not, though, because probably the internet stinks, huh? <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, uh, we're just going to uh, open up some national water model data here. We're going to open up a year's worth of, 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 of data on 2.7 million rivers. Okay, this is what the national water model does. And so, these files originally were 10,000. Wow, we really can't see anything, right? Okay, hold on. Wait. That's better, right? I think. A little bit better. Okay, so basically, we're opening up this uh, file. Um, yeah, 2.7 million rivers, hourly data for a year. This was 10,000 file, net CDF files distributed on Amazon that we brought off of Amazon because that wasn't too useful, and we converted it into Czar. And now we can just pull up a time series at a particular river really quickly, and we're showing HV plot, which allows you to hover over the river so you can see what's going on instead of just regular old plot. And here we're firing up our Kubernetes cluster because we're about to do this calculation of calculating the annual discharge from all those rivers for the year. 
And so uh, here we go, and this is reading from uh, Czar, and it's um, and it's so so each worker is getting a little blob of data, and it's and it's calculating the mean, and that's putting that back together. And so and now our workers are kicking in. So we're looking at the DAS dashboard here. Everything's cranking along really nicely, and um, uh, and actually, so I just got to tell you this little funny story because I, I was I was doing this uh, sitting in bed and my wife was like kind of sleeping and uh, you know get in the mo in the morning and um, I said oh my god I just like cranked through this entire year of of data and and, and, and you know with like 60 processors and in one minute and and she she kind of got up and she was like wandering toward the shower and she looked back over her shoulder and she said like how do you know it's right? <laughs> it's like what? Who cares? That was cool. <laughs> anyway, so um, so we plot it up, and uh, you know, using uh, HP Plot again, and you get this cool this 2.7 million dots on a map that would blow out your browser, but we're using Data Shader. The Data Shade to shade it, and we can hover over, zoom in, re-rasterize. You're going to hear all about this from Jim tomorrow, and so it's just it's just is amazing. <laughs> all right, so get out of there and finish up. So. Come back, please. No. Okay. So probably broke this little computer here. <laughs> uh, does anything work? Oh, okay. Oh wait, that's just my that's my slide. <laughs> All right, never mind. Blank, blank. Okay. So I got like two minutes left. No. Okay. Not really. Okay. But anyway, um, so I just wanted to say though, so you've seen that, you know. Pangeo, you can use it anywhere, but it's not, and it's not just for big data too. Like some people say, like, well, I'm just going to use Jupyter because I'm not really ready for this big data thing. Well, it's just, it's just Dask and, and X-Ray, you know. And so there's really no magic here. So we used it, we used it for our, our deep learning workshops. Everybody came, just logged into their browser, and everything was on the cloud. Everything worked great, no problems at all. And then, you know, and we gave a, we had a session yesterday which worked great, except for this particular laptop which couldn't do the, didn't do the interactive stuff, and that was just a browser issue. Um, and so um, it, I'm really kind of disappointed that Scott couldn't give his super cool uh, talk about what he does with uh, Landsat images on Pangeo, but he's got a great blog post. It's got a link to Binder. You can go run the stuff yourself. It's an amazing notebook. If you do stuff with remote sensing and you use Pangeo, you should definitely check it out. Um, there's all sorts of other things going on. Like it's not just for model output or for remote sensing. People are using it for all sorts of stuff. Here's this Pan Neuro. And, um, and you know, and, and my hope, in the future is that all this model, all these modeling groups all over the place and the federal government, everybody's putting their data onto the cloud. And, and you know, we're gonna have some issues with cross domain transfer a little bit, but it's all gonna be internet too. We'll figure that stuff out. Um, you know, and all the data is gonna be like inter, data proximate in this internet two sense. Um, and it's gonna be amazing, you know, for, for, the, for the efficiency of science and for, um, and for the reproducibility. Of science, so um, scales with users and, dem and demand, unlimited size data sets, crunch with a lot of processors. You don't have to maintain or buy any fancy software, and you don't even need fast internet. So Dan's happy. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. We definitely have uh, time for a couple questions here. No questions. <laughs> I'll ask a quick question. So um, thanks for the illustration of walking through from laptop to uh, larger machine to HPC to cloud. Um, so we heard in the last talk that there are definitely some challenges with getting things deployed on certain HPC systems. Yeah. And um, uh, maybe this is a question for Julian as well, but um, you know, what are some of the complications for enabling this on any given machine. <laughs> um, you could give a whole talk on that, I think. <laughs> no, um, yeah, it's been a challenge, and I think that's one real benefit of, you know, the Pangeo community. I mean, I, I was trying to do this on my own before I even knew about Pangeo, and I was struggled, you know, and, and Julian, as, as Julian has struggled, and it is, it's hard. I mean, you know, you're kind of at the cutting edge of the stuff, and Amazon, you know, and, Kubernetes on Amazon, it was easier on Google, harder on Amazon. I should say, by the way, that this is completely cloud agnostic. 
you know, so we've run it, we've ran it on every platform, you know, almost on OpenStack, on, on, on Jetstream, but on, um, on Azure and on Google, started out on Google. Now we're running it. That was on Amazon that I showed you. Um, but I think, you know, having the kind of team that Pangeo has, uh, where they got software developers and a few, you know, DevOps people together, um, there's no way we would have been able to do it, right? Uh, any of us on our own. And so all the people, you know, Jacob Tomlinson was amazing and UV Panda at Berkeley, all these people helped uh, help, helped figure this out, how to get this stuff deployed. And, um, you know, it's still, there's still some, you know, I mean, you've got some issues right here. I forget what you're trying to do right now, but you've got some issue on Amazon with the spot instances or something. And <laughs> yeah, so we're, we haven't figured it all out, but actually, you know, Scott and I were just talking and, and this has been remarkably stable though. This, um, and, and my, my, uh, my Pangeo that I set up um, like six months ago is still just running. Um, and now I've sort of transitioned off on this one that Scott and his, and, and, uh, his group have set up. And it's, um, and it's been pretty darn stable too. So, you know, it's not going up and down all the time. There's still some things to figure out. And of course, like we haven't figured out how to charge users and stuff for what they're using and all sorts of things like that. But um, it seems to be working pretty darn well, right? We've, you gave, we've been doing these big workshops, you know, 80 people show up and they all fire off a bunch of processors. We were up to like, what were in the, AG, in the AGU demo was like 2000, I don't know, way up there. And it works. Um, I don't know if you, you, you can comment on your own. Why don't you comment on your own I question? Wasn't, I wasn't expecting the <laughs> reversal of the question here, but. Um, <laughs> but no, you, you know way more about this, right? Um, yeah, maybe I'll just say a couple of things and then ask anyone, if, if anyone has questions of any of the presenters in today's session, we could just use the last five minutes to revisit any of the presentations. Um, you know, I'm particularly interested in getting some of this stuff running on Pleiades. Um, which I don't believe has happened yet. For example, um, I think that running uh, Kubernetes, and my understanding is that a lot of these HPC systems have their own versions like Charlie Cloud or other, other, there are other kind of variations of running some of the same infrastructure we've set up quite easily on the cloud that doesn't necessarily directly transfer to HPC. Nonetheless, like there are examples of it working on certain systems. So it's very promising, but I think a lot of, there's a lot of work to improve constantly. But I'll let anyone else chime in there. And uh, if anyone else has questions of any of our speakers today, we've got a few, few more minutes. People are tired. <laughs> yeah, it's five o'clock, maybe uh, one more. We've got to end it on a positive note. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering uh, for the Pangeo uh, clusters, do you see um, it more common to have like a people use or is it going to be so easy that everyone could have their own cluster and then to scale it up uh, as they need? What are the pros and cons? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Actually, Scott and I were kind of ch chatting about that too. Like uh, we started off, just had this one, uh, <laughs> one Pangeo running on Google Cloud that anybody could log into, and um, and that worked actually okay for like nine months or something like that. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, some people got on there and started really, um, really uh, use, burning a lot of resources, so shut that down. And then uh, popped up with these sort of discipline-oriented Pangeos, like where the default environment would be set up for remote sensing or for oceanography or for something else. Um, but now we sort of, um, you know, in fact, Scott was showing, showing me that, you know, it was a, well, we were talking about a different approach where, um, you know, when you log in, you just get presented with a drop, uh, drop down list of all the different environments you might want to use and you just select one. And, and so you could just have, you, you could just have, you know, operate everything that way. So, you know, there's really no limit to the size or anything of any particular cluster, although you have to request more resources from Amazon in the beginning. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, exactly how to, whether you want to set up your own or whether you, <clears throat> maybe you should just be able to log into one of these. How do we sustain it in the long term? You know, would NSF support something like this or somehow you charge people that you, yeah, we don't know really the answer to those questions. 
I think. I mean, Scott, again, you could comment on that if you want. Sure, I'll just add one one additional aspect, which is at a minimum, I think you'd want, sorry, this keeps dropping out. Um, in each region, at least with the current setup, we have big data sets in different availability zones and these um, different from different cloud providers. So this approach uh, really, um, you know, you want to be deploying this wherever those data sets are. So at a minimum, you'll want several things running in the different uh, cloud regions, I would say. Okay. Um, any any last questions? All right. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks to all the speakers in particular for preparing the today. Enjoy the rest of the conference.